I will tell you, I've had a, a long exposure to witch hazels. I am from Michigan, so the common witch hazel was in the woods where my parents live. And um, my later exposure was through horticulture. So I wanna take you kind of on a horticultural journey. You know, this is one year almost to the day or getting close to it when we started these webinars during the, the pandemic. And so it was a, a real learning curve and an adjustment period for us. But, you know, listening back on some of my recordings, I realized that I have a very conversational style. That's okay but you don't want somebody who talks so slow like me. And uh, so I'm gonna speed things up realizing I need to, to keep this kind of popping as they say. Um, so let's go back in time to 1986. And it's fun to find this story out that my real first exposure to a hybrid witch hazel was on March 9th, 1986. And I was an intern at the Scott Arboretum at Swarthmore College. And when I was there, I met Charles Cresson, who was one of my mentors there. And uh, another mentor, Judy Zook, had said to me like, well, if you, if you really wanna learn your plants as an intern, you should start photographing the plants. So back in the day, many of you remember this, he photographed slides with using a, I had a uh, Pentex 35 millimeter camera and you'd send those slides in the mail to Rochester, New York and you get them back a week later and you would hope out of the 36 slides that you took that you got some decent ones. And so my goal was to photograph a plant that Charles introduced me to, Arnold Promise in his garden. So I went to the garden, I drove by several days in a row and looked to see when it was in bloom because I lived right nearby. And one day I caught it in full bloom. And so what I did is I got out of my car and here it is, the slide, the first one I took from a distance, this beautiful vase shaped shrub in full bloom, incredibly fragrant. And then the picture on the right was one actually I later sold to American Nurseryman and Magazine. So I, I realized then I could also make money and that was pretty important because in horticulture, you don't get paid that much. But it turns out um, I took the photos and I went back to the street and my car was missing, which was like, oh my, what happened? And I, my car was missing. I looked down the street and I saw a policeman and I saw my car and I saw another car. And in my uh, exuberance to take this photo, I forgot to put on my parking brake and my car rolled down an incline and hit this Impala. So I walked down the, the street in the Swarthmore borough and I came upon the policeman and he said, is this your car? Is this your vehicle? And I said, yes, it is. And he goes, can you tell me what happened? And I said, well, you know what I was doing? I was taking a picture of this flowering shrub and I thought back the, a couple of days ago, how many policemen hear that as their first response to an accident? And I wanted to catch it in full bloom. And so I took the photo and I forgot to put on my parking brake. And he kind of looked over at me quizzically and, and said, oh, you're one of those kind of guys. <laughs> and I didn't know really how to respond to that, but uh, it turns out that my car had a broken headlight and the bumper in front of my car uh, had a, a, a minor scratch and the owner laughed when he watched these two things happen. And so I laughed and the policeman said, uh, you know, we're not going to write a ticket, but I have to tell you, you know, if you're, if you're taking more pictures of flowers, put your car in gear. Um, so that was my first meeting with Arnold Promise. Today, though, we're going to talk about a lot of things. I'll give you some fast facts about the genus, the medicinal uses. Some of you are aware of them. Species diversity. I'd like to combine horticulture with botany and natural history. And we'll talk about the people history, the history of cultivation, which I call Hemimelis heroes. 
and we'll review cultivated varieties, not every single one, it would bore you to tears. And then we'll look at how you grow them successfully. How do you cultivate witch hazels once you procure them? Where do you buy them? I'll feature that. And where can you see them in mass? Many, many cultivars. And then we'll leave time for questions as we get going and we get towards the end, I'll, I'll mention, hey, if you have questions, type them into the Q&A. Well, to begin with, there are ornamental shrubs. And I remember learning about this category when I was in horticulture. And essentially, ornamental shrubs are uh, shrubs that grow larger than typical shrubs and can almost qualify as trees. So they can grow all the groups I'm talking about 10 to 25 feet in height and some with their unusual forms that are horizontal can get quite a bit of a spread. They have a worldwide distribution, Asia and North America. There's a species native to Martha's Vineyard. It has a huge range and that's the common witch hazel. For those of you on Martha's Vineyard, and you go to different natural areas, Wisconsin Rock is a place along the trail, the Blue Trail, where you can find witch hazel. Also, Menentia Crossroads, as you're driving down that road on either side, there's some specimens there that are about 25 feet tall. We do grow this for seed for our plant sale occasionally. Um, it's a great plant, but and underutilized and underappreciated. What they're noted for though, in general, is their uh, winter or off season blooming, which we'll talk about. They have numerous medicinal uses, which I'll get into. And then we'll talk about species diversity. One new species, relatively speaking, was just discovered in 2004. I mentioned the botany I like to cover. Uh, there's a term called Maris which is used in botanical descriptions to describe a flower and the witch hazel flower is very curious. It's really the thing that people most notice. It's a four Maris flower. Virtually everything about it is in four. It has four strap-like petals, which you can see with my cursor here. And it's subtended by a calyx from four sub petals right here. They're not a petal, but they're part of the floral structure. Four stamens, which you see here. And then what you don't see, you kind of do, I guess, are these four staminodes, which is very curious. So the actual pollen, here's a picture over here, a drawing, is the anther is porcital on the stamen. It opens sideways to release the pollen. And then at the very base, the staminode, which is this right here, this stalk, is, is really interesting. A staminode is an anther without the top portion or a stamen without the anther at the top. And at the base is a nectary and it's the nectary that draws the insects in. So that also adds to the fragrance of the flower. For people who know and propagate witch hazel, they're shot out of these capsules, literally. And here are these black seeds, they're oblong and they're sclerophorous or woody. Uh, they're not that hard to grow. What they're hard to do is collect because they will shoot out 10, 15, 20 feet. They have this projectile system within the seeds that help them disperse. I collect the seeds just when they're showing that they're about to crack open. I put them in a paper bag. I take a paper bag and put it on the windowsill and like jippy pop popcorn, they pop out the seeds. And then I treat them to moist storage or stratification over the winter, sow them right around now. And most of the time they germinate, not hard to grow from seed. The name which hazel or more so hamamelis comes from the person who named it and that was Linnaeus in 1742. It's the combination of two Greek words, derived words, hama meaning same time together and melon meaning fruit or apple. So hamamelis means flowering and fruiting at the same time. So here's a fall scene in October, even late November. And what happens is this plant gets pollinated, the flower on the common witch hazel, but it takes all the way to the spring to the pollen tube to grow. 
and fertilize the ovary. And then after fertilization, you get the seed that's formed here. So this seed hasn't gotten to the, the point of cracking open. It's kind of more or less newly formed after pollination and waiting for the winter to, to overcome and open it. So that is the curious thing about the flowering of witch hazels, which bloom in the fall. Here, they're native to Martha's Vineyard on stream beds, not in water, but up on shelves, uh, close to water. Um, so they're not plants that like what we call wet feet. You may or may not have heard of this, but the structure of the branches is such that they might make witching sticks or dowsers that are used to search out waters or reputedly precious metals. I, I, I hadn't heard of that. I have seen it used to douse for water. So it is a divining rod, if you will. So it, it does work for that. And it's particularly notable in the South used for that because of the shape of the branches. And you can see that in the form of the plant. There are five species, three in North America and two in Asia. One we were just talking about the common witch hazel has a huge range that goes up to Nova Scotia, Northern Michigan, and then it goes over into Alabama, the panhandle of Texas. Some people, not so much here, but others classify certain portions of the range, some varietal forms, Virginiana, um, and then also Henrii, and then Mexicana, which goes over into Mexico. So that's kind of a disjunct population. Um, it turns out those, those plants in Mexico flower in the summer, uh, but they've maintained that this is just Hemimalis virginiana and the diversity combined within. Here are the flowers that have a, a nice fragrance. That they're really wonderful to come across in the fall. Here's a plant at Poly Hill, not too far from what we call the yellow corner. Um, and there's a grouping of them that we have that are all fairly big sized plants that Poly Hill obtained and planted years ago. Most of ours drop their leaves and then show their flowers, but a complaint by some persnickety people is that they don't like the fact that the leaves are retained often and obscure the flowers. It depends on the genetics of the plant. The ones that we have oftentimes, uh, either their, their leaves are frosted and the blooms persist and remain and, and look like this, or they can be like this, where you have fall color, which is really beautiful, kind of butter yellow, with the bloom at the same time. Here you can see some leaves remaining. These are the plants at Poly Hill. I really like this plant a lot. It's a, it's a real favorite of mine. So witch hazel is not surprisingly the uh, source of the um, witch hazel, the extract that people use. Um, it's distilled and essentially it was discovered in North America by Reverend Thomas Newton. And he started a company that's still active today. It's the first commercially available witch hazel astringent, pure natural extract. And people back in the day, and even now, uh, believe that it had great use for uh, many, many uses for, for your skin, for cleansing your skin primarily. Uh, the witch hazel before that was used for medicinal purposes by the American Indians for leaf tea for colds and sore throats, twig tea rubbed on athletes' legs to keep muscles limber, and then the bark itself was taken for lung ailments and used externally for bruises and sore muscles. Today, it's widely used for all these different things, eye ailments, ointments for skin irritation and toning skin. Uh, the process is kind of interesting. They coppice the shrubs, so they just cut them down to the ground rejuvenate them and they do them over time so they can always have the source of new branches coming up. They chip the cut branches, which are quite big through a chipper. They take the chips and put those into a steam vault. They steam those and then they get the extract out of there, the astringent. And they add a little bit of alcohol to it. Uh, not always, but many times they do that for the, um, for the whole uh, process. So 
Uh, I'm sure you're aware of it. You might even use it. Here is a, their website, which I went to recently. And I, I like this down here. The alternative name is Snapping Hazel. How would you like that as a nickname? It hints at another use that the tree ejects its seeds explosively into the air. Uh, and, you know, this is their thought of its widespread propagation and avoid overcrowding. It's known in certain places as the winter bloom. Um, so I thought that was a curious thing. And in, in this you can find on the web. Well, let's go to the second witch hazel, which is also, I think, underutilized in gardens and one that Poly Hill Arboretum has really gotten involved with. And that's the Ozark witch hazel, Hemimelis vernalis. Now with that name, specific epithet vernalis means spring. And we're getting there. So this is also known as the Ozark witch hazel. And we went to the Ozarks in 2016. I have a plant in my garden here, my home garden. We have plants at the Poly Hill Arboretum at the entry garden that were grown from seed from this expedition. Hemimelis vernalis, out of all the species we talk about today, has the most diversity of color forms. Um, the only setback is it doesn't have the petal size that others prefer, more showy petals, um, but I find them to be really beautiful. So here they bloom on, on Martha's Vineyard, that is, in February, the third week of February, sometimes earlier in the Ozarks in Arkansas, they bloom in January. So this particular plant was really brought to our attention by Sargent uh, at the Arboretum, Charles Sprague Sargent, and he had hired a collector named Benjamin Bush in Arkansas to collect plants, and he sent Benjamin Bush a, a flowering branch and you know it was at an off season late in the season in February and Sargent thought well it's just Hamamalis virginiana but then he asked for more samples and then Sargent said you know what this this is a new species so the Arnold Arboretum was the source of naming this plant here is the range of Hamamalis vernalis. Here's where we collected it in the Ozarks. You know, a lot of us <clears throat> don't travel that much, but if you can go to the Ozarks, you can treat yourself to great camping, low price places to stay, and unparalleled natural areas. It is one of the most incredible places on earth if you have a chance to go. And here are the three areas we went and collected vernal witch hazel. These plants, some of them were 30 feet tall. Here's Vernalis as a close-up. Um, I really have to thank uh, Philippe de Sporberg for allowing me to use his slides where you see PDS. He's provided many of these and many close-ups. Here's a little shot though of those staminoids right here with no uh, anthers at the top, but at the base, the nectaries. So this is Vernalis. And the curious thing about all these plants is that these strap-like petals, like a party streamer, will fold back in in cold weather or fold back in when there's snow or frost and then reopen. So a witch hazel can have a flowering period of up to six weeks. And I've seen that. It's really incredible. Now, here's a shrub that was named in Germany. It's a dwarf form of Hamamalis vernalis. And actually, there's quite a few selections. This one has the name Quasimodo. And it's like, thank you for that name, the hunchback of Hamamalis. But it turns out that this is a more of a dwarf form that is quite floriferous and apparently very fragrant. And so this is a plant that more or less is in North America, is in culture and it's in North American collections. This is a plant in a large plant that's fairly old at the um, Ar West Blar, Arboretum West Blar in Belgium. I should mention Vernalis usually has yellow fall color to orangey red. Here's a variation in the floral color. It's called Sandra, a little bit lighter in color, light yellow. Sandra is notable for its fall color. This is really nice, um, beautiful plant. There's one called Sachet that has extra long petals. And this is from Longwood Gardens. Laura, my wife, took that photo. And she also took this one, Variety Carnia. 
which has incredible uh, red fall color and small reddish flowers. Here's one called Red Imp. This is from the Scott Arboretum, which has kind of crinkly petals. When I mentioned before that there's a total of five species and three in North America, this one was discovered in 2004 and named Hemomelis ovalis by Steve Leonard. And I've met Steve Leonard before. Uh, it is relatively new in 2004. He's like, well, that's a long time ago, not in botanical history, but they had at the time had thought that it was endemic to Perry County in Southern Mississippi. And it has red flower color in a clonal habit, kind of like Hemomalus vernalis. And for the longest time they thought it was, but it turns out it's not, it's a unique species. And then since 2004, recent expeditions by Ron Miller and Rick Lewandowski and Wayne Webb, these people I know that are, are in the field a lot, have turned out populations in the Panhandle, Eastern Georgia and Eastern Texas. I'm very excited this year to be able to actually travel to some of these areas where Hemomalus ovalis is listed. I believe we have some in cultivation here at Poly Hill from other expeditions that were given to us. The flowers on the top here, Hemomelis ovalis. This is one form, but I've seen yellow forms, darker red forms of it. And then also Fred, my friend who used to be in Alabama, believes that this is a hybrid of Hemomelis ovalis with Hemomelis virginiana. So they have really kind of unique floral forms. And I, I do think that both Vernalis and Ovalis could be used in crosses to bring us some unique colors. The group we're gonna talk about today though is the one that's most popular in the nursery trade and that's the hybrids that exist between the Chinese witch hazel and the Japanese witch hazel. Uh, they are or have yielded the most ornamental selections and they bloom from February to March and Many of them are frag fragrant, really fragrant. And there's over 125 selections. I would say probably over 150 really now. Hemomelis japonica has a lot of varietal forms. The typical one is Hemomelis japonica, variety japonica. But we collected in two different trips, Hemomelis japonica variety obtusata, and obtusa, I'm sorry. And uh, they are, both those plants are in the arboretum, in the ground now. They're like three to four to five feet tall. And some of them are blooming today, which is kind of exciting. So it's fun to go out in the wild and collect plants from Japan. China, the Hemomelis uh, mollus witch hazel or the Chinese witch hazel has an extensive range, kind of like the common witch hazel does here on uh, Martha's Vineyard and throughout North America. It has a, uh, in China has a huge range. And this is one that uh, there's many wild collections of. So, you know, it's curious, the, the first hybrid that was kind of came on the scene, there was collections happening and growing in the 1920s and the early thirties at the Arnold Arboretum. At the same time, there was Hemomalis collections developing in Denmark and also in Belgium. And what was happening is people were bringing these different species together for the first time, growing them in outdoor garden conditions, collecting seed from them, and naturally they found hybrids. So I believe it, it was 1929, William Judd, the plant propagator at the Arnold Arboretum had collected seed I, I believe that was off of Mollus and uh, they planted those out and they had an out beautiful, beautiful plant that later on um, they decided the Arnold Arboretum to name Arnold Promise, Hemomelis X Intermedia representing the hybrid. And so this particular plant was the go-to number one plant for witch hazel enthusiasts for the longest time. I used to receive a catalog from Wayside Gardens and there'd be a gallon plant of Arnold Promise for like $100 or $80 because they were so treasured. That's not the case anymore. There's tons of diversity and Arnold Promise has become probably the most common 
commonly planted witch hazel. We'll go into what I call Hemimelis Heroes, part one. <laughs> I mentioned Belgium was also working on releasing or at least cultivating the intermediate uh, witch hazels. And at Arboretum Kalmthout in Kalmthout, Belgium, a tree plantation was started a long time ago, 1856, by Charles Van Gert. And he had a collections of rare trees and shrubs that he grew there for, before selling the property after 40 years to Anton Court. And then Court himself had an extension collection of Hamamalis and Witch Hazel and uh, had to close his business down due to the Great Depression. But his collections remained, and that's kind of curious that, you know, there are arboreta that are abandoned or private collections. And when you go into them, you can certainly find some interesting trees and shrubs persisting. And the good fortune was in 1952, it was purchased by the brothers George and Robert de Belder to save it from being destroyed by a housing development. And at that site, they purchased the property, the de Belder brothers founded what is now called the IDS which is the International Dendrological Society, one of the largest groups that were put together, extremely active today to promote and preserve and conserve rare and endangered plants. Robert de Belder and his wife, Jalina here, who's pictured with him, worked together to build an internationally known Arboretum. Arboretum Kalmthout, also their home, uh, another property called Heimreich uh, was developed collections there. And they're both open to the public now. The DeBelders have passed on. Uh, their children are still alive, uh, but they play a really important part in some of the key introductions of Hamamelis. In 2003 and in 2008 and in 2012, I was able to go to Belgium and to Arboretum Kalmthout that's pictured here just an amazing collection of plants. It, it's, it's stunning, it's, 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 it's a beautiful place. And, our, and here's Heimerich down here, an, an enchanting, beautiful, beautiful uh, European garden. There's heroes in other spots too. In North America, Tim Bratzman, and he's in Madison, Ohio. I've known him for as I get older, a long time, I never give the year, but back into the 80s. He is a masterful plant propagator, really brilliant guy. His nursery was the nursery that really brought a lot of the paper bark maples and their hybrids into cultivation. But what he's mostly known for is uh, collecting and getting European introductions into the United States. So Tim is really, really knowledgeable. And then this man right here, Chris Lane from Witch Hazel Nursery, which is in Kent, England. And Chris has what we call the national collection of witch hazels in England, just a, an incredible nursery. It's a bucket list place where I'd love to go. I, I can imagine all these rows of witch hazels in bloom at the same time, over 125 different kinds. My goodness, it's Nirvana. And then Hamamalis Heroes Part Two, Roy Clem, who ran Clem Nurseries for many, many, many years and Song Sparrow Nurseries, had a lot to do with selling witch hazels, the intermediate hybrids, but also had uh, developed many clones of Hamamalis Vernalis. And those of you who sat through my uh, Redbud seminar know that Harold and Alex Neubauer at Hidden Hollow Nurseries in Tennessee are master grafters. And they're the principal people along with Tim Brotsman who are cloning these plants and grafting these plants and getting them into North America and into our gardens. So I always say this, if you, if you really have the hemimelis bug or can't get enough, you should own this book, um, which is called Witch Hazels, a Plant Collector's Guide put out by the Royal Horticulture Society, the RHS. When I was a young man in 1987, I lived in England and I worked at the Royal Horticulture Society and saw many of these um, cultivars for the very first time. But what the RHS does is they trial and they 
give awards to certain plants that have superior characteristics. And this is a review by Ann Raver, who's terrific. New York Times, Mr. Lane has compiled known species and varieties and not considered the, the witch hazel Bible. Okay, one thing you can do if you don't own it is just get it from your local library. You know you can do that and then return it so you don't feel so guilty. But um, it has the history of cultivation, uh, all the clones known to date. It's back in 2004 now, so it's out of date already, but it's still worth uh, buying. Here is Chris Lane at his nursery in Kent, England. And this is to tell you a little bit of a story um, of how they went about kind of reviewing and evaluating these witch hazels at his site. Liz has sent you this. I'm so happy to have kept it. It's from an article by The Garden, um, which is the publication, The Garden of the RHS, Royal Horticulture Society, where they they brought all these people who know a heck of a lot about witch hazels to the nursery over a three year period uh, to witch hazel nursery and they evaluated them. And what they did is look at the variation primarily with the X intermediates, the hybrids between Mollus and Japonica. This is a collection at the Scott Arboretum. This is a slide that Rhoda Maurer gave to me. And here's an example going from right to left. This is Vernalis variety carnia, carmine red, similar. Just straight Vernalis, Lombard sweeping, red amp, and you go down the line, there's a, you know, 90, 100, 125 of these in, at Chris Lane's nursery. So the Woody Plant Committee uh, ended up looking at 138 cultivated varieties over three years. There were 36 cultivars, surprisingly, of, of Vernalis and Japonica. 90 cultivars, their focus was on the, the X intermedia. And so what they do when they find an outstanding plant, they award a garden merit award. Uh, it's, it used to be called, I think it, it might still exist, the first class certificate for certain plants. But um, out of this process, they looked at flower form and color, flower longevity and scent, and then the plant's former habit. And then they came back in the fall and they looked at fall color, that's something to be aware of that it's not just the winter blooms. Some of these plants and a lot of plants in the witch hazel family have really good fall color. One thing to know about flower form and color reading Chris Lane's book is, and I realized this preparing for this talk, we've had our witch hazels in bloom February with the Vernalis, but the intermediates opened maybe three weeks ago or so. And you know, they change over time. When I say change, they don't get raggedy and worn. You know, they, they fizzle out eventually, but their colors actually do change colors over time. And that color also, depending on when you photograph it, is really affected by the light that's around it. If it's full sun versus a day that's kind of shady and overcast. So that's something I, I learned out of all this. You'll see though, there are different forms. Most of the ones we're talking about are vase shaped, which I'm going over with my cursor, a rounded bush. Some are upright, um, spreading. You know, you really do have to have room for plants that get horizontal. And then some are grafted, which I've seen just one plant grafted as a weeping form on a, a standard and it's not so hot. I think it's kind of I don't know, artificial looking. It's just my own take on it. But uh, this particular trial, and you have this to read at your leisure, you'll see uh, what they looked at and the, the plants that they felt were the best out of the group. So here are some of them. We have these at Poly Hill, a few of these, particularly Oster Gold, which is a late blooming one. Pallida, which is a, a very standard one from many, many years ago. So here are the different groups, the yellow citrine or what I would call gold cultivars in certain instances. The ones that I've highlighted here, Arnold Promise, Brimstone, Chris, Pallida, 
Wisley Supreme, and I should mention Vesna's, are all uh, very, very fragrant. Some have a soft scent, some have a pungent scent. Um, the publication you have kind of goes into which ones are which. Arnold Promise, though, still one of the top ones in, in considered. Uh, Palada also was the gold standard for many, many years. We'll talk about some of the newer ones that are really, really cool. Here I'll start out with Arno Promise. This is the scan of the slide and the infamous day of my car wreck. Here's Arno Promise though. And this is, this is what it can look like in Michigan where I first cultivated it. And this is in a shop from Belgium, but it, it can be snowed on just like this. I mean, it's really a miracle that these plants bloom in the off season. Here's Pallida. This was named at the Royal Horticulture Society. They have the, the mother plant there. And for, the, for many, many years, it was considered the number one. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so um, you do see this sold. And at Wisley, when I worked there, the original plant was there. It was about 30 feet when I was there in, in the early 80s. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is a plant that's kind of obscure. It was named at the Scotter Breedum. The year I was there, I guess I have to confess that now, it was 1985 to 1986. And a few things happened in the Hamamelis world. Um, Steve Wheaton had discovered a seedling that was really quite nice in the witch hazel collection at the Scotter Breedum. So they named it Early Bright. At the very same time, J.C. Ralston was came up from the J.C. Ralston. It wasn't the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. It was the North Carolina State Arboretum at the time, but he brought with him a truckload of many new cultivated varieties that he had, had shipped over from England. And I remember when I was there, I was accessioning all these new witch hazels that were all in bloom. And one was Jelena. And I just remember how, how beautiful it was. So that was kind of an early awakening to this group. One I really like, we have it at Poly Hill, is Primavera. It, I think it has really beautiful kind of orangey yellow flowers. Here it is at the Scott Arboretum. This is kind of unusual for it to be retaining its leaves. Here it is again, uh, just a prolific um, and, and very fragrant Primavera. Orange Beauty is there, you know, to my mind, looking at a lot of these, there's a lot that look like this. So <clears throat> I'm not so sure on some of these new names if they're either not the same plant or the variation isn't as, as um, cut as it should be. I talked about a rounded bushy form. Is it possible this is Angeli? Um, it's kind of stiff looking plant behind it. Here is Ruby Glow which grows very tall and wide. Here's Angeli up close, kind of a softer yellow, fragrant. This one is called Barnstead Gold, and this is supposedly an improved form of Pallida. Um, I'm not sure that's the case. It has longer strap-like petals. Here's another picture of it. It seems to me, at least on this photograph, that it's, it's um, a little bit darker in its color. We have this at the Poly Hill Arboretum as a newly planted plant. Here's Harry, which looks a little bit like Orange Beauty. We'll go over to the orange, copper, and red cultivars with the intermedias. Here are some that won the Award of Garden Merit. And we'll go through these. You have real descriptions in your handout. The one that we love and just are kind of going crazy for at Poly Hill, which was planted, I don't know, maybe five, six years ago, maybe a little longer than that, is Aphrodite. What makes it amazing is great fragrance, but it has these super long petals and they're kind of segmented, but it's really the color, the deep color of the calyx. And then this, this orange color, which is really unique. 
um, we planted it out on the road and it's actually in a cool place where people can drive by it and there's a holly behind it. So it really stands out. But we all agreed recently we should get another one <laughs> and put it in another spot uh, where you can see it. And, and we intend to do that at Poly Hill. One that is a, a, takes up a whole ton of room is called gingerbread. I really like it though. It's kind of like Yelena, I should say Jelena, uh, with long, long petals, but it's definitely a wide plant. And this is, um, has a little bit of a fragrance from what I recall. Here's one of the top ones that we've had at the Arboretum since 2004. When I was the curator in 2002, uh, in 2003 and then part of 2004, I bought from Broken Arrow Nursery uh, a few cultivars at that time. And now those plants are quite, quite large. This is either called Gel Gelina or Gelina. Um, and this is named after uh, the DeBelders and it was raised there. I, I love it. It has great fall color. It's very fragrant. It's, I have two witch hazels three at my, four at my house. I forgot I have the two species, Vernalis and Virginiana, and I have Jelena and um, Arnold Promise. It's a good combination I've seen with this plant with the midwinter fire, the stems of Cornus sericea, or sometimes Cornus stolonifera, it's listed. The combination of using this witch hazel in the backdrop of those stems. This was named after Jelena's husband, Robert, and you can see it's a large, large plant, Robert de Belder. And here it is up close, similar to Orange Beauty um, and a few that I've shown you, Harry, the other one. This is a photograph of a witch hazel near the cow barn. We have two of these on our site, Ruby Glow. And this one has really rich red fall color. I'm sorry, rich red flower color and really good fall color. So it's worth pursuing. It's a large uh, upright plant, which is kind of also spreading. This is a curious uh, version of a different cross, not intermedia. And that's Vernalis cross mollus. And I'd like to get this, it's called Breva petala. And it almost looks like it has a double petal, but what it has is it's more clustered flowers um, all together, lumped together. And it does have a, a sweet fragrance. It's quite showy, it's, it's a little club-like because they all are congested on the stem like this, but it, it's a beautiful plant. I really like it a lot. Good fall color, I should have mentioned. Okay, one of the top five, we think, we'll put Aphrodite there, but Aurora. Uh, ours now is just in full bloom and it's been really cool to watch it actually change colors, which, which I talked about. It was open and now with these warm temperatures, it's really sprung open, but Aurora is one that is another one. Maybe we'll get even more of those because of their beautiful spidery flowers. It's, it's terrific plant. This is named after the owner of the property, the nursery that would eventually become under the ownership of the DeBelders. Um, and it turns out that uh, this is Anton Court and he, he also developed the Hemimalis collection on that property and eventually, as I mentioned, the DeBelders took it over. We have this at the Arboretum, I like it a lot. Um, very, very unique color. Diane is named after Diane de Belder, and it also, I would say, with Jelena uh, and Diane and Ruby Glow, probably the most popular ones to come out of Belgium and all with kind of, you know, darker color flowers. This one is growing at the Arboretum over by the Beetle Bungs uh, with Jelena and Ostergold. Good, great fall color. Here's a shot of the fall color. Here's a comparison of Anton Court, Livia, which we'll talk about in a moment, and then Diane all kind of compared together. 
Livia is one I think we, we should get. I know it's fully hardy and other people have it in North America. So we will procure this one. So you've seen a lot of witch hazels. Thank you for going through that odyssey with me. We're, you know, we're how do we grow them now that we, we've gone through a list of them? They all have very similar cultivation um, requirements. They perform best in moist but well-drained soil. That's what we hear about almost every plant, right? Uh, acidic soil, they actually in the Midwest, the intermediates and certain high al alkalinity areas don't do as well. And then you'd choose Vernalis if you were in high al alkalinity. They don't flourish though in heavy, wet, compacted soils that are, that are subject to drought stress. They're not an urban tree. You should give them the room to grow. I have seen a lot of witch hazels, mostly landscape architects putting them so close together. You're like, well, let's just use two instead of five in that same space. Uh, but it turns out that you can prune them and maintain a smaller size. The flowering, should, this should be done after flowering before summer, because anything after summer in the fall, you're removing the flowering wood for the following season. They grow best in full sun in terms of fall color and flowering. It's always a benefit to mulch <clears throat> and keep the roots cool. Flower size and the duration of bloom are reduced in hot, dry spring. So that's something that we're aware of if we have like a dry May and into June, um, it might impact the bud set for the following year. This is true, deer eat witch hazels, they do. And we have a lot of deer on Martha's Vineyard. Some cultivars may be susceptible to leaf blights. In mildews, there was for the longest period of time a problem with a canker it appeared on Arnold Promise. Um, I don't think that's still around anymore. The thing that more, most likely happens to the untrained eye is these plants are grafted, the intermediates and the clones are grafted all on Hemomelis virginiana. That's the preferred rootstock. At times they're grafted onto Hemomelis vernalis and that's a problem because vernalis is really a shrub that um, sprouts all around the base. But virginiana will sometimes sprout uh, and overtake the the scion, your, you know, the cultivar that you're trying to grow. So the rootstock can outgrow the scion. And what you notice is different flowers or no flowers on a branch or the retention of leaves on a branch, which Virginiana will show. So it's not a big deal. You just need to cut those off or they'll engulf the tree and take it over. What gets them out into the trade? Well, grafting and all the wonderful people who are plant propagators and bring these plants to our attention. So they're split graft or splice graft onto Virginiana. So these are all rootstocks of Virginiana with the scions wrapped in slice graft or splice graft into the side. What they do is they wrap them in paraffin, they put a little heat on them and they actually, over time, the cambiums align and then the plants um, combine together with the, the rootstock being Virginiana, but then you cut that off. So they'll chop off the part that's Virginiana and then they'll allow the scion to grow. So that's really how they get out in the trade. What pollinates them, I often wondered what pollinates them. And when I was working in a garden at Michigan State, uh, gosh, 1984, so uh, a professor had set up uh, one of those, I guess they call them shell no pest strips, kind of like those greenhouse um, strips that, you know, flies and things, and white flies adhere to. So they found these little fruit flies that were pollinating most of the witch hazels late into the fall. So they're always insect active in our garden. Uh, fruit flies, blow flies. Today I saw a fly on my Jelena and also bees were on Arnold Promise the other day. 
reputedly wasps, moths, and beetles are also pollinators. So we think these plants wouldn't be doing anything in the middle of a cold period, but all of these creatures are active and pollinating. Where do you buy witch hazels? I'll quickly go to the bottom and say, buy local whenever possible. Um, and that is really true. I've mentioned this before. Ask your nursery people to either get it for you or get them in for you. And that way they'll start to stock the plants. Many of our local nurseries here carry witch hazel. So, so certainly go there first. Here are some nurseries that we've purchased from in the past or Polly Hill, Collector's Nursery, Forest Farm. These are really old school nurseries. Uh, most of ours have come from Broken Arrow Nursery. The Broken Arrows in Hamden, Connecticut, um, it's not that far of a drive from, you know, you, you get it onto the Cape and you can go see them within a couple hours. Uh, great plants, great plantsmen there, great selection, and they have <clears throat> numerous cultivars. It's the, the fact is they don't ship every one of them. They only ship the smallest sizes. So um, here, here is the list of, of places you can go, but certainly go to your local nursery. Where to see them? Uh, the best place, I think. Uh, in North America, one of the best places is Green Spring Gardens in Alexandria, Virginia. Years ago, um, Chris Strand, who's now at Winterthur, was, was there working. And that was the beginning and with a few other people to collect every witch hazel they could. So they hold what's called the PCN, Plant Collection Network, of witch hazels. And so if you were to go there in February, in March, you would just see you know, hundreds of plants and incredible collections. So I urge you to go there. They had 215 different types, or I should say total hemimelis and 110 different types that are unique cultivars or species. The best time, February, early March. Locally though, uh, the Arnold Arboretum certainly has great collections and it has collections from Wilson, uh, Benjamin Bush, Palmer, others, uh, the famous Michael Dosman, Andrew Kopinski, um, Steve Schneider. You can go and see plants at the Arnold Arboretum. One, wonderful collections, historic too. Mount Auburn Cemetery has great collections as well. Heritage Gardens on Cape Cod also has a good witch hazel collection. When you look at it though in the Northeast, um, one of my favorite places with a really great, great collection is the Scott Arboretum. And I've been there during their peak and it's, it's just amazing. Went with her, uh, Chris Strand is there and several large, huge plants of these cultivated varieties are there. The Morris Arboretum, uh, Longwood Gardens has great collections, some large, large plants. Brooklyn Botanic Garden, and then the U.S. National Arboretum in Washington, D.C., another great place to go. I'm sure I'm missing some, but these are places I've actually visited and know. So, Finally, you have this, <clears throat> excuse me, it's Arboretum uh, Kalmthout's uh, webpage. The director there, uh, Abraham, had, had sent me a, a list a, a few years back. And so you can go, and, or we sent you the list, or it's in the chat where you can actually go see all these cultivars listed the year they were introduced, uh, any synonymy in you know, which ones are new versus which ones are older. Uh, if you go to Belgium though, they have a witch hazel week. And that probably is in and around early February. And if you are there, go to Essen or, or, or Count Arboretum and, and see their amazing collection. It's fantastic. It's great in the fall too. You should go there if you're anywhere in Belgium at any time. Well, I wanna thank all these people listed who have either contributed to my knowledge or given me bits of information or have provided photographs or help me put this together, which I really appreciate. 
um, all their work and their contributions to this. I also want to thank Liz Ladwig for setting this all up. Uh, we're about at the end. If you have any questions, um, type them in. I will end with a story. Like I like to tell stories, but I have my own Arnold Witch, Promise Witch Hazel that's starting to look like Charles Cresson's Witch Hazel that's caged by deer here. And here it is on the right. I took this photograph yesterday morning and I was looking for um, insects on it. And then after that, I was really reminded that the world really hasn't changed. It's still full of witch hazels when I got into my 2007 Corolla. I don't change much and drove away. And when I got to work, I put on the parking brake. Anyway, thanks everybody for joining me and we'll take some questions when you are ready. All right. Thank you, Tim, for that really wonderful presentation and all those beautiful witch hazel photos. Um, so we have a couple questions. If you have any questions still, feel free to put those in the Q&A. Um, and it looks like I have a couple questions in the chat. So um, the first question is, how can we keep the deer away from witch hazel? Well, the only way you really can do it is to cage them because they're so valuable. Um, I have four plants and, you know, it's kind of like a, 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 a ritual here, at least on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, so what I do is I cage them. And then when, most of all, when they get in flower, I'll take the cages away, but I spray them with Bobex. And that's kind of a spray, it's a deer repellent. I've been doing that for years. It's really critical that you do that when they're young plants or they'll just get demolished. So it's just an unfortunate thing. They do like to eat them. One curious thing uh, about, we, so use repellents is I guess the short answer in caging. But the one curious thing, there's another group of related plants that aren't as showy but are beautiful called Coralopsis, which are in the witch hazel family. They're called winter hazel and, and their twigs are poisonous to deer. So those bloom in about two to three weeks. They're equally beautiful in many, many ways. So I wish that the stems of hemimouse weren't so tasty, but they are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, our next question is, is the blooming tree by the road in front of the nursery on State Road a witch hazel? In front of the nursery on State Road, a blooming tree. Um, if it's blooming right now, it's the one in front of the homestead is, is a witch hazel. I think, I think we're talking about the same, same thing because right at the nursery, there's not anything blooming there currently. Um, so that's Aphrodite if we're talking about the same plant. All right. Uh, and then is Chinese winter hazel related at all to witch hazel? Chinese winter hazel. Um, well, I think what you might be talking about is Coralus, which uh, I should have mentioned this before. Coralus is the hazel or hazelnut. It's throughout China and particularly in Europe, it's the source of hazelnuts, the, the nuts that we eat. Um, and it's not related, directly related. In fact, it's in the birch family, but it has these, and it has different flowers altogether that are called catkins. But the leaf is strikingly similar to Hamamelis. So Coralis uh, is known as hazel. So when you see witch hazel, it's in reference to actually a Coralis-like leaf or a hazel-like leaf. And I should have mentioned this. Yeah, they look very much alike, but their flowers are completely different. All right. Um... So I think that that's all of our questions. If anyone else has a question, 
feel free to add it in the next minute. Um, but thank you everyone so much for joining tonight. Thank you, Tim, for sharing all of your knowledge about witch hazels. Um, and I will be posting a recording of the webinar on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you'd like to revisit any of it. Um, and then also just a reminder that the link to those handouts that Tim was talking about is in the chat, but I also emailed it to, I think all of you. Um, and our next webinar is going to be April 7th. Uh, our horticulturist Oliver is going to be doing a webinar on ecological design, if you would like to join that. Um, the sign up is on the calendar on our website and you can also check out our website calendar for more events that will be coming up. So thank you everyone. Um, and if you have any questions for me, um, I'll be sending out an email after um, the Zoom, but you can email me at Liz Ladwig, L-A-D-W-I-G at polyhillarboretum.org. So thank you. All right. Thanks, Liz. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Have a good evening. <laughs>